My name is Vincent Sutherland. I am the Executive Director of the Center on Race and Equality in the Law. And I am so thrilled and pleased to welcome you all here um, for our first in a series with the NYU Law Review, uh, The Anatomy of Racism and Inequality. Um, and today's panel will be The Anatomy of Racism and Inequality, the United States Separate and Unequal. It'll be moderated by Russell Robinson, um, who is a professor of law at University of California, Berkeley School of Law, and is visiting as a fellow with our center uh, this semester while he's on sabbatical at Berkeley. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Russell momentarily. Our next two events will be on November 4th, so a week from today. Um, uh, that panel will be focused on race and an exclusionary democracy in America. And we'll have another event on November 15th at the same time in the same place focused on criminal justice um, as well. So looking forward to this wonderful conversation. I'll turn it over to Russell. All right, thank you, Vincent, and thank you all for coming here today. Uh, we have an esteemed group of civil rights experts, and I'm looking forward to hearing their talks. Uh, we are going to save time for me to throw a couple questions at them, uh, and hopefully time for you all to join the conversation and ask some questions. Um, I'm going to give uh, very brief intros um, so that we can preserve time. Um, they all have extensive bios and accomplishments on their organization's website, so I encourage you to get the full version online. Uh, I'm going to give you brief versions, and I'm also going to introduce them alphabetically, and they will speak alphabetically. Uh, so first, uh, to my right, um, is Richard Bury. He is the Chief of Policy and Public Affairs at the, is it KIPP or KIPP? KIPP. KIPP Foundation, where he leads their efforts concerning public policy, advocacy, marketing, and communication efforts to grow the KIPP network and advocate for policies that make it easier for students to afford college and overcome other barriers to success. While the CEO of the Children's Aid Society, he founded the Children's Aid College Prep Charter School in the South Bronx. Most recently, he served as deputy mayor to New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, where he led key initiatives, including Pre-K for All, which for the first time offers free full-day pre-K for every four-year-old in New York City, increasing enrollment from 19,000 to 70,000 in 18 months, and Thrive NYC, a comprehensive effort to improve New Yorkers' mental health. Dennis Parker serves as the executive director of the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, an organization which was founded in 1965 to fight for economic justice for our nation's most vulnerable, which includes low-income families, communities of color, people with disabilities, immigrants, and children. And prior to joining that organization in January 2019, Dennis served as the director of the racial justice program of the ACLU. Before that, he served as the chief of the Civil Rights Bureau in the office of the New York Attorney General, and for 14 years worked on and directed the educational work of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. He serves as an adjunct professor at New York Law School and Columbia Law School Teachers College, where he teaches courses on law and social change and education law. And he's a graduate of Harvard Law School and Middlebury College. Kim Sweet is the executive director of Advocates for Children of New York, a not-for-profit organization that fights for access to quality education for low-income children facing barriers to academic success in New York City's schools. She leads a staff of more than 50 attorneys and education specialists. Um, and while at AOC, Ms. Sweet started the Arise Coalition, which now includes more than 60 organizational and individual members working together to improve education for students with disabilities in the city's public schools, as well as a statewide coalition for multiple pathways to a diploma. She holds a BA from Brown University and a JD from Columbia Law School. And Philip Tegler is the Executive Director of Poverty and Research and Race Research Action Council a civil rights policy organization based in Washington, D.C. Mr. Tegler has written extensively on the application of civil rights law to federal housing and education policy, including most recently coordinated action on school and housing integration, the role of state government, and several other publications that I won't read uh, because of time. Um, his organization's housing policy work focuses on the implementation of civil rights mandates in the major federal housing programs, the defense of fair housing policies, and the connections between fair housing policy and environmental justice. And his organization provides leadership and staff support for the National Coalition on School Diversity. And um, also, he previously worked as a staff attorney and legal director with the Connecticut ACLU. 
and he served for three years in the clinical faculty at the University of Connecticut School of Law and is a graduate of Columbia Law School. Uh, so let's welcome them all. I've asked them to speak for 10 minutes each. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Bury, and we do have a timekeeper that will remind you when your time is up. All right, I'll speak in my normal New York fast uh, speaking. Uh, good morning, uh, thanks for having me, great to be here. Uh, so I wanna talk to you about uh, high stakes testing in New York City in particular, and how screened admissions have a negative impact on school segregation. Uh, so folks have been following the news about New York City high school admissions. You may have heard of Stuyvesant High School if you're not from here. It is a city's flagship public high school. Uh, and in the most recent year, uh, this fall, uh, New York City, by the way, about 70% of our students in New York City are black and Latino. Uh, and this fall, uh, 33 Latino students and seven black students were admitted to Stuyvesant in a class of 900. So about 4% black and Latino in a city that's almost 70% black and Latino. Uh, now, Stuyvesant is just one school in a city of 1,900 schools, but it's really an exemplar of the problem of New York City, which is that we here essentially operate two separate public school systems. Uh, one is very high performing. It's got you know, all the things you expect in a high performing school. It's got uh, alumni associations and parents who raise money, um, strong test scores, strong high school graduation rates, college matriculation rates. Uh, that school system is primarily white and Asian. Um, and is predominantly middle class. You have another skill system uh, which is struggling across all those domains. You have schools where literally single digits of students are reading or doing math at grade level. Um, those schools are predominantly black and Latino and are much poorer than the other school system. Now it's not really news in America that children of color are more likely to attend struggling schools. It's in part a function of residential segregation as well as laws that allow uh, communities to uh, assign students based on their residence and then uh, to fund schools based on local tax burdens. So a lot of that is grounded in residential segregation. Um, but as important as residential segregation is, it is not the only driver of school segregation um, and the unequal opportunity that comes with it. And in New York City, at least, the prevalence of screened K through 12 schools is also a significant factor. So when we talk about screen schools, we're talking about schools like Stuyvesant that use some type of screen uh, to determine admissions. So it can be anything like standardized tests or uh, school grades or um, essays, uh, teacher recommendations, uh, auditions, so anything sort of other than like uh, zoning or a random assignment. Um, and because white and, uh, white and wealthier students are more likely to perform well, on screen assessments, particularly those that rely on standardized tests, systems like New York's that heavily rely on standardized tests in their admissions are, of course, more likely to be segregated. And what's interesting about New York is that New York is sort of unique in the heavy reliance on these screens. I mean, they're not, uh, other schools have them, other systems have them, but no one relies on them quite to the extent that New York does. Um, and, uh, and particularly screens that use either exclusively or heavily make use of standardized tests. And so the question for me that's always been interesting is in, in this sort of very progressive city, why do these screens persist uh, even knowing the impact, the racially segregative impact that they have on admissions? So just to step back for a second and talk a little bit about how uh, screen schools work in New York City. So it starts in elementary school. So, New York City has a system of gifted and talented schools and programs. Uh, admission is based on the standardized test. So four-year-olds take a standardized test to be admitted to the schools. Uh, many families uh, engage in test prep, um, uh, you know, pay a lot of money to engage in test prep to train their four-year-olds to pass this test. Um, and not surprisingly, again, in a city where 65 to 70 percent of the kids are black and Latino, only about 18 percent of those admissions offers, offers go to black and Latino kids. Um, now that's a relatively small percentage of seats, uh, about 16 or 17 percent I think of, of uh, kindergarten seats are gifted and talented seats, um, but it gets more intense in the upper grades. So uh, fully 36 percent of New York City public middle and high schools uh, are either fully screened or partially screened. Um, now the highest profile of these are its eight specialized high schools, which include Stuyvesant. Now by state law, uh, the, those eight specialized high schools have to use a test called the spe uh, specialized high school admissions test uh, in order to gauge admissions. There's no other factor they can look at. They can only look at that test. 
Uh, if you score highly enough, you get admission to one of those schools. Uh, that law, Heck, the Heck Calandra Act, was passed in 1971, and it was passed intentionally uh, because uh, there was a lot of outcry at the time about efforts to change the admissions process uh, to diversify those schools, to have more black and Latino schools in, students in. Um, uh, but the, heck, the state legislature passed the Heck-Calandra Act, uh, and it's been very effective in terms of keeping uh, the doors shut for black and Latino children. So in 2019, black and Latino children received 10% uh, of admissions offers, offers to all of those schools, again, in a system that is almost 70% black and Latino. Um, much like the GNT exam, uh, the specialized high schools have spawned uh, an extensive test prep industry. In fact, it's much more intense even in a pre at the kindergarten level. Um, and what it means is that families with means can invest much more in test preparation. Uh, and many Asian American families who don't have a lot of means, uh, nonetheless, uh, are investing tons of money in test preparation. So these are only about 5,000 5, seats in the specialized high schools. But again, as I said, just the tip of the iceberg, 36% of schools use some kind of screen. Now, recently, there's been some pressure uh, to reduce the reliance on these screens. Um, and uh, what's been interesting to me is that a lot of these uh, proposals have not received a broad level of support, even from black and Hispanic uh, advocates and elected officials who've often proposed uh, adding more programs, adding more GNT programs, adding more specialized high schools without actually making any adjustments to the way that students are admitted to these schools. Um, so another, a number of things, so this is another question that is very interesting to me as an advocate trying to think about why this is. Now, at center of it, it's because of middle class families who uh, obviously have a lot um, of investment in the current system because, again, we do have one highly functioning public school system here that's highly, uh, primarily middle class families. Um, <laughs> but I think that, but, but you know, of course, that's not the reason that most people give when they're defending this uh, very unequal system. Uh, the defenses that people tend to give to the system uh, tend to be couched in conversations around merit. Um, and it is, in fact, that prominent of that idea of merit that makes it so difficult, I think, for many people to challenge uh, these systems. And people think about this in different ways. So the first and the obvious way is thinking about um, just a basic classic idea of merit that, you know, students who work hard and who've demonstrated uh, their skills should be able to go to the best schools. And um, that's obviously a very compelling idea. And there's a lot to that argument. You know, if you look at higher education, you know, you think about elite college admissions 30 years ago, a place like Harvard was not very uh, selective. You know, they admitted most of the students who applied. The problem is that their applicant pool was entirely uh, WASP men from New England boarding schools and preparatory schools. And so the story about standardized tests in higher education is, is at least in part uh, a story about how tests can help to expand the applicant pool. And so while you still have uh, elite colleges that continue to be dominated, uh, by that population. You can argue that the, it's less, uh, that they're at least more diverse than they were 30 or 40 years ago and that standardized tests um, have played a role in that. And arguably, you could argue that that same, uh, that same factor plays a role in K-12 admissions um, for public systems where you're trying to allot uh, a limited number of seats. Uh, the problem with this idea that standardized tests, uh, the problem with this idea, the idea that standardized tests are an effective way uh, to sort students into schools, but it doesn't work in a system where opportunity is so clearly a function of race and socioeconomics. Uh, and the reality is that the myth of meritocracy, this idea that we're going to use these tests to sort people fairly, really in a lot of ways has simply replaced one sort of dynastic system, uh, uh, the aristocracy, has just replaced it with another one called the meritocracy. meritocracy. So like in a race that begins before you even have children from conception, you have privileged families that are investing heavily in their children's development. They're placing those children in the light schools. They're providing them with extensive amounts of human capital, social capital, economic capital. And they enter an economy which deeply prioritizes uh, those kinds of credentials and that kind of education. Uh, and then they grow up, they marry other children who are also of privilege, and they have more privileged children, and it persists. Uh, and in some ways, it's a more, it's a more uh, powerful way of maintaining uh, intergenerational wealth than the aristocracy is, but it's also easier to defend because they can claim that the privileges it grants are earned rather than inherited. Uh, so it really sort of speaks to the old trope about like, you know, being born on third base and thinking you're triple. But the power of the meritocracy is that it manages to convince most of the other players that that person actually hit a triple. Uh, we've all sort of internalized this idea. Um, so let's do the first problem of merit. 
The second problem is not normally what we think about when we think about merit, but it definitely matters here is that a lot of people defend uh, screen K through 12 admissions because it resonates with how we think about um, identifying the merit of systems leaders and school district leaders. So the idea that we would actually hold public school administrators responsible for the educational gains of students is actually a relatively new idea. You know, for decades, there was no meaningful accountability if you were a school superintendent about whether or not, uh, particularly your poor students, were achieving. Um, and that really changed fundamentally um, under uh, Bush and Obama administrations, where the condition of federal funding uh, for the first time uh, there were really robust standards, and school systems were held to standards and said you couldn't get funds unless, you, um, unless your students were achieving. Uh, and so that's one of the big appeals of standardized tests, and, and again, it's, it's compelling. The problem is that um, it's flawed because uh, using standardized tests to evaluate school systems doesn't work as well when you're talking about a high-stake test because there are so many different incentives that teachers and administrators and students have. Uh, to essentially game the system, from outright cheating to extensive test prep that may not actually be measuring whether students are actually learning. Uh, there are much better tests, like something called the NAEP, uh, which does not have any high stakes, which is a much better tool of actually evaluating whether students um, are learning. So just to conclude, I'm a little over time, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, I think the question in New York City, it's not a question of, of rejecting standardized tests necessarily. But it's recognizing that if we're going to have these tools and thinking about how we admit students in New York, we have to really think about the way that they work and understand how they work to perpetuate uh, the sins of America's history of segregation. So admissions practices that might work for college may not make any sense in kindergarten. Uh, a standardized test may be a helpful data point, um, but it probably doesn't make sense to use it at the exclusion of all other sorts of information that you might have. And more fundamentally, uh, the idea that with a set of students who are just gifted in all domains, and those students should be in schools um, by themselves uh, and challenging schools, and that there are other school students who are just not gifted and who don't need challenging schools. It's just not a realistic way about humans develop. People have genius in different dimensions, and uh, it's not saying that you shouldn't use tests as a way of figuring out where a student has special skills that should be challenged. It probably does not make sense to build a school system on that way. So, Pass it on to you and look forward to uh, hopefully having some time for conversation. Thank you. Rich talked a little bit about um, the role that wealth plays in terms of admissions to the specialized schools in New York. And I want to speak more generally about wealth um, because it's, it's really one of the most persistent vestiges of our, of our country's history of racism and uh, discrimination. Um, from the time when black people were considered property, they were um, and then even after being freed, were denied opportunities to own property to accumulate wealth. And in spite of the passage of the civil rights laws, in spite of the victories in, the, in, in various cases, um, and even in spite of some, some advances in wage um, equality, the, the wealth gap has uh, remained um, stubbornly uh, persistent. Um, and various measures have shown different um, amounts of a disparity, but essentially the, the wealth gap between black and white or Latino and white uh, families is anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, um, with the whites uh, uh, families having much more wealth. The reasons for these are really complicated. Um, they include uh, discrimination in employment, exclusion from fair housing, and an opportunity to, to uh, purchase and, and, and own and have housing that appreciates in values, um, the denial of access to banks and loans. All of these factors play a part in, in the problem of, of the wealth gap. But what I'd like to talk today is, is the role of segregation in education as a contributing cause and factor. Um, in limiting economic mobility in the United States. Um, and when I speak about segregation, I, I include racial, ethnic, and um, economic isolation. Those are frequently um, related, but they are not the same things. Um, but their impact is, is a serious one. It's been 45 years since the United States Supreme Court decided the Milliken versus Bradley case. Um, which is one which limited the authority of the courts 
to remedy inter-district school um, segregation, and which really um, limited, as you remember, Milliken versus Bradley was the Detroit school system. When white students fled Detroit to go to the suburbs, the court um, tried to impose a remedy that included those suburbs in the remedy. The Supreme Court said that absent a finding that the suburbs themselves had discriminated, the court didn't have the authority to include them. And so what happened is you had a sharply defined racial and economically segregated school system in the, in, in the suburbs and in the city. Um, so that was 45 years ago, and of course it's been 65 years since the decision in uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Um, as far as race and ethnicity, there was a period of increasing racial desegregation in the late 60s and, and in the early 70s, but with the, with the decision in Milliken and in Rodriguez, that period came to an end. Um, and what we've seen, as shown by Gary Orfield's study, is that, that students of color are increasingly finding themselves isolated um, in schools. And at the same time, there's this racial and ethnic isolation. Um, schools are becoming increasingly segregated on the basis of economic status. And that's both in terms of between school districts and uh, within schools within a school district. The implications of this economic segregation, particularly when allied with racial and ethnic segregation, are serious. It contributes to the growing um, achievement gap. Um, it contributes to the growing income gap in, in the gap in, in uh, college attendance and completion. Um, and it has a, has a profound impact on the resources that are available to, to students um, and the context in which students are educated. Um, the reasons are many. Um, one is there is, of course, a, a link between school funding um, and concentration of poverty in schools. Um, typically in the United States, a substantial portion of school funding is based on local revenue from property taxes. Um, and that lack of, of revenue coming from, from property track, uh, uh, taxes um, results in, in differences in the availability of instructional resources with, with lower tax uh, districts having fewer instructional resources, less regulus less rigorous uh, curriculum, and teachers with, with less experience, training, and certification. Also, wealthier districts tend to vote to spend more on education than poorer districts do. Um, and poorer districts face greater demands um, on revenue, including higher costs for security, need for higher salaries in order to try to attract um, teachers with greater experience, the greater costs that are associated with uh, providing services for a higher number of students who have um, special language needs or um, had less of an opportunity for exposure to preschool and early education opportunities, those students who didn't have the benefit of the work that Rich did here in New York. Um, and there are benefits of environments that are both economically and racially and ethnically integrated. Those benefits include higher average test scores, greater likelihood to enroll in college, less likelihood of dropping out, reduction in racial um, achievement gap, opportunity to work with, with, with a diverse group that encourages critical thinking, it, it could reduce uh, racial bias and counter racial stereotypes, makes it possible to, um, or more likely, that, that people will seek out integrated settings in later life, um, teaches leadership skills, on and on. These, these benefits um, present themselves when there is more socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic um, diversity. Um, it, it makes sense economically. Um, programs that encourage this diversity um, return investments three to five times as much as the cost of the program. Um, it's a more effective way of uh, bringing about um, um, educational advantages. It makes it possible 
to uh, promote access to resources, um, equal access, um, prepares people to succeed in a global in a global economy, um, and um, and in studies in the past, the children who attended integrated schools had higher earnings as adults, improved health outcomes, and were less likely to be incarcerated. The the issues that that Rich outlined in terms of the the programs for admissions to schools are exactly the reasons why there is this increasing um, separation of, of um, students either based on their economic uh, background or their racial or ethnic background. And, and it, is, it is disturbing um, being in New York and seeing in a city that is known as being a progressive one how basic that resistance is, even on people, even by people who pride themselves on being progressive. Um, a, a study a few years ago showed sadly that if given a choice between everyone having equal opportunity or your child having more opportunity, that the majority of people chose the latter. Um, and um, that impulse the impulse um, that, in spite of you know the the gentrification that goes on in New York and in other places, that that white parents are still resistant to having their children attend schools with students of color. Many white parents, I should say, um, attend schools with children of color with lower income students, and and the consequence of that is serious. It means that students are denied the opportunity to, to achieve their potential, and it's a cost that not only those students and those communities pay, but it's that one we as, that we as a society pay. Um, it's expensive to practice this kind of segregation. It's expensive um, to create the results that we have created, and it's a denial of the rights of individual students and the opportunity to achieve their uh, potential. Take it away, Kim. All right, I'll take your mic. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kim Sweet. I'm the Executive Director of Advocates for Children of New York. I'm going to take a minute just to talk about what my organization does because I'm going to talk a little about what we see in our work. So we were started in 1971 um, with a mission of advocating for students and their parents in the New York City public schools. That's our focus is New York City. Uh, we are founded on the belief that every child should have access to a quality education and the opportunity that hopefully goes with it. Um, our approach to advocacy integrates four strategies. The bedrock of our work is we help families one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we help about 8,000 families a year who call us or meet us at various fairs or out in the communities um, and ask us for help with a whole range of education issues. Uh, we also train about 10,000 parents and professionals a year in how to navigate the gargantuan New York City public school system. It's another really big part of our work. and. Um, when we're out talking to all those people, we start to see systemic problems, right, that aren't just individual, for individual children. And based on what we see on the ground, we develop a, an advoca uh, advocacy agenda for systemic change. So we do policy advocacy, we do impact litigation. Uh, we have programs focusing on specific educationally vulnerable populations, like students with disabilities, immigrant students and multilingual learners, homeless students, and students involved in the court system or in, in the foster care system. So all of these populations are subject to more than their proportionate share of a lot of things, including suspensions and school exclusion. Um, and most have disproportionate representation in the special education system as well. Um, today, I was asked to focus on race and special education, so that's the part of this work that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and just to start, we see evidence every single day in the cases that we handle that race and ethnicity impact how students with disabilities are both labeled and sorted within New York City's special education system or the New York City's public schools. So in preparation for this panel, um, I decided to look at our own data. So we pulled uh, 
4,669 special education ca cases that we handled over the last three years, and these are just the cases where somebody remembered to enter the race and ethnicity information that we tell everybody to enter. Um, but one thing when you looked at, at, that, um, at that data that really just jumped out very starkly uh, was very clear disproportionality in terms of special education classification. And classification is the label that's given to students to describe their disability. So most strikingly, black students were disproportionately classified as emotionally disturbed, while white students were more likely to be classified as other health impaired. These are different categories under the law that you can use to, to put kids into the special education system. Um, and just to share that the um, extent of that, in nearly one in six of our black clients with a special education classification was labeled as emotionally disturbed versus one in 10 of our white or Latinx clients. On the other hand, almost one in five of our white clients had the classification of other health impaired compared to about one in eight of our black clients. So it's, it's a pretty... Um, distinct difference. And this data, you know, I was looking at our own data, but then when I looked at the New York City um, school system as a whole, it says the same thing, shows the same pattern. Anecdotally, uh, we see this disparity a lot when you have a student who has ADHD, a very common uh, diagnosis, who's uh, struggling with behavior in school. White students will be more likely to be labeled a white student with ADHD will be more likely to be labeled other health impaired, which generally has less stigma attached to it, and a black student will be more likely to be labeled emotionally disturbed. So these labels have all kinds of implications uh, for a student's education, including, very importantly, with, whether they're educated in an integrated or segregated environment. So I'm going to step back a little and talk about special education and integration and segregation. As you may know, the New York City school system is made up of 32 school districts that are based on geography. There is also a citywide district called District 75, which is comprised entirely of students with disabilities. When students are classified as having a disability and entitled to special education services, they can receive, that, that they can receive those services in any school in the 32 school districts, and they can get that either integrated into their general education classroom or they could be segregated into a class that's only for students with disabilities within a regular school. But there is another option. They could be assigned to a school within District 75, which generally means that their classroom and their school has only students with disabilities. So assignment to District 75 means that students will likely have limited, if any, contacts with students who don't receive special education services even if they're sometimes physically in the same building. <clears throat> so going back to the impact of how students are labeled, if you're labeled as emotionally disturbed, as you're more likely to be if you're black, your chance of ending up in District 75 is about 38%. If you are labeled as other health impaired, your chance of ending up in District 75 is only about 4%. So bringing it all back to race, we do in fact see black students significantly overrepresented in the highly segregated environment of District 75. And you know, Rich was talking about segregation at the higher performance end of the, uh, of the student spectrum, um, but we're also seeing it across performance levels in students who are struggling, uh, more likely to be segregated if in fact you're black and have behavior issues of some kind. Um, so I've been talking about the impact of race on how students are labeled and sorted once they get into the special education system, and that's just one example. But there is lots of data nationwide regarding the threshold question about who's determined to need special education and who is not. And it shows really unequivocally that black and Latinx students are disproportionately identified as needing special education services in the first place. So in New York City, for example, 77% of students who are found eligible for special education services are black or Latino compared to 63% citywide, and that's uh, in school year 17-18. 
Recently, there were a couple of interesting studies published that seemed to show that racial disproportionality in special education depends somewhat on the racial makeup of the school that you come from. More specifically, these studies, which were not done in New York, they were Florida and Wisconsin. These studies indicate that black and to a lesser extent Latinx students are over-identified for special education when they attend predominantly white schools, but under and under-identified when they attend schools where they are the majority, which is interesting. So I should say, uh, in wrapping up, that in, in our work in New York City, we see both sides of the coin. We see students of color who are in segregated special education classrooms who never should have been sent there in the first place. And we also see students of color who need a lot mm -hmm. of support that they never received because no one ever identified them as needing special education services. So we really see it cut both ways. Um, I think the answer, frankly, is that schools have got to get to the point where they can provide support that a wide range of students need in classrooms without segregating them, uh, in classrooms that are integrated by both race and ability. Maybe I should take yours if ah. you're okay. Thank you. All right, so uh, I think the discussion so far, getting into the weeds in a sense, the mechanics of the ways in which these systems uh, disadvantage um, low-income children of color um, is important, especially for um, lawyers. Um, it kind of undergirds the whole analysis of disparate impact. Uh, now, of course, in the education field, um, bringing a claim on the basis of a disparate impact is much more difficult after 2001 because of the Sandoval decision in the U.S. Supreme Court, which basically held that you can't bring those type of cases um, in court. You have to bring them in the administrative agency at the Department of Education in D.C. And of course, during this administration, there's not much that's going to happen bringing a disparate impact claim for any of these uh, uh, these uh, mechanisms that have been discussed. Um, in the housing field, what, what, what I'm going to touch on, um, we still have the ability to bring disparate impact claims in court to challenge these kinds of mechanisms on the housing side. The Trump administration is in the process of uh, eviscerating the disparate impact uh, regulation and rule that governs the, the uh, conduct of disparate impact cases both in the agency and in court. Um, there were, uh, I think, a record number of uh, comments submitted on that rule. It just closed last week, 45,000 plus comments attacking uh, the, the, uh, the Trump administration's proposed rule. But that's disparate impact, and uh, uh, let's hope it stays around for um, a few more years because it's one of the key ways to, to challenge these types of policies. So um, on the housing side, uh, you know, the roots of segregation run very deep. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the recent, very recent books by Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law, uh, Jessica Traunstein, Segregation by Design, which really uh, go into great detail on the history of intentional uh, federal, state, and local uh, segregation policies, both uh, in land use and housing. Um, you know, famously uh, including uh, the, develop the, the funding of suburban infrastructure, uh, 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 roads, uh, sewers, um, uh, schools, um, the uh, uh, federal mortgage insur uh, insurance for whites only to fund suburban subdivisions uh, development, and the uh, express uh, disinvestment uh, and refusal to insure uh, uh, housing for African Americans in redlined uh, urban areas. Um, uh, piled on in the mid-century with urban renewal, um, dispersion of integrated areas and the concentration of African-American low-income families in uh, intentionally segregated public housing. This history is well-documented, um, popularized uh, recently by ta Coates in the case for uh, reparations, and um, the history of it goes back a long way, uh, including the great book American Apartheid by Massey and Denton from the 90s, which was required reading at HUD in the first Clinton administration. Um, but um, that history is obviously still with us today. The legacy of that has been compounded over time. Uh, but what we're 
concerned with in my organization, which is a civil rights policy organization, is the way that uh, this, these, uh, uh, this legacy of segregation in housing is being compounded and perpetuated and even increased today by our current federal housing programs. Um, and in spite of our efforts over the past two decades to reform those programs, they're still having the same uh, impact. Um, we did a study uh, last year uh, with the Furman Center here at NYU, uh, kind of asking the question, how do the major, uh, the four major federal housing programs uh, impact school segregation? Um, and we, we looked at the, the, the four uh, major federal housing programs, the largest of which is the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which uh, gives families uh, vouchers to rent private apartments, and then the public housing program, the project-based rental assistance program, and the low-income housing tax credit program, which account for almost five million additional units between them. Um, and the results are pretty uh, astonishing. We, we did the uh, analysis both nationally and for each state and metro area. Here in New York State, um, for housing choice voucher families, these are vouchers you're supposed to be able to use in any neighborhood, right? Um, families in, in New York State um, are living near an elementary school, families with vouchers, an elementary school at the 22nd uh, percentile of school proficiency um, in that metro area, and um, schools that have an average of 79% uh, poverty rates measured by free and reduced price lunch. Um, similarly, public housing in, in New York State, um, near very low proficiency schools, 85% poverty rates in the local elementary school where we've located public housing. Project-based rental assistance and low-income housing tax credit program, uh, very similar um, high percentages, over 80%. Um, poverty schools uh, located near these developments. And the low-income housing tax credit developments are developments that have been uh, put in place largely in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Um, very few of these uh, families living in uh, federally assisted housing are near uh, a low poverty school or a high performing school. Um, these are also disproportionately uh, racially segregated, racially isolated schools. Um, and this is, this is really, uh, the conclusion here is that we have a federal policy of uh, placing low-income uh, children of color uh, near low-performing, high-poverty schools. Um, and that's the schools that they attend. Um, recent research by Sean Reardon at Stanford um, has kind of confirmed that what's really going on here is this um, totally disproportionate exposure of African-American and Latino students to high poverty schools. And that's where the real harm of segregation is hitting these kids to be, um, to be disproportionately placed in high poverty schools. Um, now, how does this happen? What are the mechanisms now? I could go on a long time about that, but I won't. But um, just to give you uh, a few examples, in the Housing Choice Voucher Program, um, HUD has for uh, many decades uh, set the rent caps for the program based on regional averages um, that um, are pulled down by the high density, low cost housing in the segregated areas at the center of most metro areas. Um, basically confining families to higher poverty neighborhoods just by the design of the program, compounded by other program features such as the limitations on public housing authority jurisdiction to specific geographic areas and the difficulty of uh, families moving across those uh, boundaries. In the low-income housing tax credit program, the federal government has placed a premium on putting low-income tax credit housing in poor neighborhoods uh, through a variety of incentives that are built into the statute. Um, and that program, although it's doing better recently after a lot of um, litigation, uh, fair housing litigation and advocacy, um, it has historically performed even worse than the traditional public housing program in terms of uh, steering low-income families with kids into um, high-poverty segregated neighborhoods. Um, so there is a civil rights reform agenda for each of these federal housing programs. We're working on that with a lot of our partners in DC. Um, but what does this mean for the future? Um, and we're currently looking at um, the potential for a new democratic administration uh, at the federal level, perhaps, um, and possibly even a, uh, a democratic Congress. Um, 
after 2020, and I'm not jinxing anything by saying that. I, it's, a, it's a possibility. Um, and you know, we, we see uh, some really ambitious uh, presidential platforms on housing. You know, uh, Senator Warren is talking about $500 billion uh, of new federal housing spending, much of that going into the, uh, this new program, the, housing, the Federal Housing Trust Fund. Um, Sanders you know, is talking about $1.48 trillion um, over 10 years going into this housing trust fund. Um, similar, you know, S Senator Booker is looking at $40 billion into the trust fund, et cetera. Um, now, all three of these candidates I've mentioned um, are also looking at different kinds of incentives and mandates to open up exclusionary communities to housing. However, none of these candidates are, are thinking or talking about the kind of guardrails we need. And, and when I hear you know, uh, 40 billion or 50 billion or 500 billion into a housing trust fund that'll be block granted to state governments to spend as they wish. I'm seeing another low income housing tax credit program, another public housing program, another development program that will be subject to, um, you know, the exclusionary zoning of opportunity hoarding communities um, and the desperate need of low income families for housing, which will trump these civil rights concerns and kind of locking in another generation of segregation. And I have to say, just as a little context here, our concern really is not about so much about places like New York City and Washington, D.C., where the, the, the presenting issue, civil rights issue, is really gentrification and displacement. We spend a lot of time in the rest of the United States, places like Milwaukee and St. Louis and Cleveland and Minneapolis and Buffalo. Um, you know, out there in America, they're still locked in to the legacy we've inherited from uh, the mid 20th century, um, and it's getting worse. The number of concentrated poverty neighborhoods in this country is expanding, and the number of families who are living in those communities is still expanding, and it's a civil rights priority, I think, for the next uh, president and administration. Great, thank you all uh, for those really interesting and um, challenging um, talks. I've got a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and both concern how the Trump era is influencing the work that you do, and so in some ways it builds on where Mr. Tegler ended. Um, and so to me, it seems that there are at least two <coughs> trends that might pressure you to reconceive your work. Um, and I wanted to hear if you've thought about or grappled with those pressures. Uh, one is it seems that the news cycle is so Trump-centric that like whatever he's doing or tweeting on any given day sort of determines what we focus on, right? So if it's the Muslim travel ban, if it's the latest immigration policy targeted at Central American migrants, um, there's so much energy and focus and conversation that is uh, directed by the president based on um, whatever policy he's pursuing or talking about any given day. Um, is it challenging to talk about sort of long-standing civil rights issues like segregation if people don't see how it connects to what's happening in the news with this administration? How do you sort of keep people engaged and interested and focused when the conversation in some ways seems to be shifting based on this sort of Trump-centric news cycle? Um, and then I'll ask the second one, but maybe, well, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll offer both now and you can choose which or, or, or none uh, to address, um, or both. Uh, and so then the other thing that seems to be different in the last 10 or so years is the rise of social media, right? So this is, again, the link to sort of Trump on Twitter. Um, and it seems that sort of more and more, especially young folks like many of the people in the audience today, are living online and building communities online, doing political organizing online, meeting dates and partners on Tinder. Um, to what extent does the social world online create new possibilities that, you know, the sort of physical infrastructure may not permit. Are you, are you thinking more about social media and the role that might impact or the intersections between social media and schools, neighborhoods, physical infrastructure? I'll take a shot. No. Um, with the former question, there are a few things that, that, that in some ways, um, the, last, the last three years or uh, two years plus 
has made it clear that these are civil rights issues, that there is clear racialization um, in all of the areas that we're talking about, that, that, that the pretense that, that racial disparities still exist, it's hard to maintain that in the face of just the explicit um, racial discrimination that informs all of these things. So, so you know, we we do continue to focus on that. I mean, one of the things that 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 I speak about in my work, and I've heard other people say, is that we do have to resist the temptation to suggest that the era before 2016 was some, you know wonderful area where there was no problem. I mean, the fact is um, these problems have been around for a long time. There were serious problems of racial inequality and economic inequality. Um, we will have to address those and we will have to continue the efforts that we were on, that we've been undertaking nonstop forever, basically. Um, but we are also now in the position of having to fight to, um, to not lose the disparate impact standard, to, to not, you know, one of the, the things about this work is I think the realization that, that, that you never win the battles, that you can't just win it and move on to the next area, that, that you are fighting to keep from losing ground um, or fighting to regain ground that you've lost as well as fighting to, to achieve the goals that, that, that you've been fighting for for a long time, that it is a nonstop struggle, but it is an important and a necessary one. Thanks, Dennis. I, I had a similar reaction. You know, I, I think in some ways the challenge that I was describing is that uh, we have what is fundamentally a racialized problem, which is described in a way that has nothing to do with race. People say, well, it's not about, it's not about black kids or brown kids, it's just about kids who have merit and kids who don't have merit. Um, I think part of what uh, the Trump era makes it a little easier is it brings to the surface the racism that underlies uh, much of that rhetoric. And that I think really does coincide in the social media, because if you follow some of the news in New York around um, some local desegregation plans, uh, downtown Brooklyn, the Upper East Side, other places where um, there have been these viral videos of like parents, a white parent in a meeting uh, where there is some threat to the status quo, saying things that are, uh, you know, pretty obviously racist uh, rhetoric around why they don't want their children to go to a school with other kids, why having black kids or Latino kids come into their schools is going to ruin the quality of their schools. I think the combination between the combination of um, the ease which with with those examples are uh, come forward and. Um, and sort of the great and heightened awareness around the role that race plays in decision making, I think does create something of an opportunity to move this conversation forward. I think where I've been more pessimistic, at least in New York, is that at the end of the day, even with that rhetoric, you still need sort of a political movement uh, for black and brown kids, of and black and brown kids to sort of demand educational equity. And there still isn't really, I would say, I, I don't feel it every day, sort of a, uh, I mean, uh, you sort of look at some of the numbers of these schools and we could go, we could go with a different way that the school system fails black and brown kids, both the obvious examples and the um, less obvious examples. Um, but if you sort of talk to most of the, Demo the likely Democratic candidates for mayor of New York City, for none of them is education really a priority. Again, when uh, Mayor de Blasio put forward his proposal to change specialized high school admissions, uh, a few black and Latino politicians came out in support. Most of them immediately changed their mind once there was backlash. And if anything, there have been many more black and Latino public of elected officials who've come out against that plan than anything else. Um, so there is still something missing there. Um, but again, I, I, I do think there is something about the combination of social media and the moment that makes it easier. And just one, one story. So, you know, I, I, I was on a local television show uh, talking about the specialized high school admissions test, I was sort of debating. Uh, it's um, it's uh, hosted by an African-American journalist, and I was debating uh, an Asian-American uh, advocate who wants to keep the test. And after he, we started, stopped filming, he said to me, you know, uh, he said to me and the African-American host, who's a, you know, Ivy League educated lawyer, uh, he said, um, you know, Asian kids, uh, we don't worry, we don't like, we don't prioritize basketball. 
uh, we don't prioritize basketball, but like black, but Asian kids don't complain about not being in the NBA. It's just like the specialized high schools. You know, black kids aren't, aren't prioritizing education. Um, so we shouldn't be complaining about not getting into Stuyvesant. And he sort of couldn't figure out why me and the host uh, <laughs> sort of pointed this out as sort of a racist thing to say to us. But there is something about the moment that I think uncovers this conversation, which um, uh, doesn't solve the problem, but at least makes it a little bit easier to engage. Um, I'll just add to, uh, to what Rich was saying, um, that I think it, I have noticed that at least in New York City, on the segregation issue, there is a lot more media attention paid to segregation, again, at the higher performing levels, who gets into gifted and talented, whether they should be gifted and talented, specialized high schools, who gets into them, whether they should be them, then there is interest in the students that I was talking about. Um, and, or, you know, what happens, you know, there's this whole thing, it used to be called over-the-counter assignment, which is what happens if you change schools in the middle of the year. You, you go to a family welcome center and they send you to a school. Well, they genuinely, generally send you to a very underperforming and under-enrolled school, which again, greatly exacerbates segregation. There's a lot less interest in the media in those issues. And if I was going to guess why, I think it's because a lot of the reporters are either alumni of these prestigious schools or they're worried about sending their kids there. You know, it's just personally much more interesting to them, um, where I think the li they don't have maybe the lived experiences of people who are struggling with students um, who are not on the higher performing end. So that, that's been a frustration of ours, is a lot of a lot more interest in the top and top of the system, less interest at the kids who um, aren't there. Well, and in keeping with that last point, the, a lot of the media conversation around um, race and education is on the Harvard lawsuit, right? So we're talking about Harvard, which is not the most egalitarian institution. And so it's, you know, there's a sort of uh, overlooking of the many other ways in which there are concerns about um, segregation and inequality that extend beyond elite universities. Um, all right, let's open it up to questions uh, from the audience. Yes, in the back. Yes, I'd like to ask the panel, uh, what are the debates going on about conforming the entire public education system in general? That is, you know, I went to a specialized high school in the 60s, and I remember these debates were very hot and heavy back then, especially the issues that are raised right now with the specialized high school. And I'm just curious where we're at in terms of spending more money on the high schools, trying to solve the problem in the elementary schools that uh, seem to be uh, even worse than they were when I was in elementary school in New York City. What about the broader debate? I mean, that's a big, I mean, I'm not sure to start, I mean, that's a big question, right? So uh, again, I, I think two things. One is that I think the level of crisis, and I do think our schools are experiencing a crisis because again, um, we actually do have a very well, high performing public school system for a small percentage of students. Um, that remains, I think, given the impact that has on our city, uh, is, does not really take up enough of the co public consciousness in terms of what we talk about when we talk about New York City uh, and life in the city. So there are a range of issues. You know, the city has made broad investments in early childhood education. There's an active debate around school desegregation, although it's not clear that we're going to have movement in the way that we just, that we would like to, I would like to see. Um, there's an active debate about the role of charter schools. Um, there are questions about uh, pedagogy and how we train students. Do we have enough teachers of color in the school system? There, I mean, there are a range of active political debates, I, I, education debates. I, I, what I think, though, the problem for me is that there actually isn't, um, although there are, there are questions and debates and questions about how the schools work, there isn't really a, 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 a live public uh, conversation about those things in the way that are likely to drive policy. So those conversations exist, and people are having those conversations. There isn't a real movement to drive change. Uh, and so the real question for me is, how do you drive, a, how do you build a movement in New York City that will actually put the needs of black and Latino children first, um, poor children first, so that these problems, which you know we can all keep debating, but that these problems are closer to the center of our political dialogue than they are today. 
Yes. Um, thank you so much for wonderful talks. A few of you have mentioned the Supreme Court. Um, and as we know, the composition of the court has changed over the past years and might yet change, uh, particularly if uh, the Democratic uh, presidency doesn't have it. Um, so what should our posture be towards the Supreme Court? Do you see it as uh, a place that could yet yield some positive results? Or is it a barrier or hurdle to overcome? And how do you, as advocates, plan to navigate that? All right. I, I'm not planning to navigate it at all, thank you. But um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm looking back at the two uh, Kennedy decisions that we just won. You know, the the uh, parents involved in community schools that uh, basically uh, struck down race-based school integration programs in Seattle and uh, Louisville in 2007, but upheld the compelling government interest um, in school integration. And, and the importance of districts doing everything they can to achieve that short of you know, selecting children on the basis of their race. Um, I think that decision uh, is in great jeopardy and there's uh, the, one of the conservative legal groups that was involved in that case in 2007 um, is involved in several other challenges around the country trying to get a new case up to this new more conservative Supreme Court, I'm very worried about that. I'm very worried about um, the uh, decision in 2015, uh, the landmark decision in Inclusive Communities Project uh, versus Texas, upholding the disparate impact standard in the Fair Housing Act. Um, another Kennedy decision, very important uh, decision, um, kind of going, looking at the whole history of the fair housing movement in the country uh, as, as a response to government-sponsored segregation um, and, and really, a, a, really a wonderful decision, which is now under threat because of the uh, proposed uh, Trump disparate impact rule, but also potentially um, a future case going up. Would the result be the same with uh, a, a significant shift in the, in the court personnel? Um, hopefully precedent matters still, but uh, I'll let Dennis maybe uh, respond to that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, you know, it, it's it's a be afraid, be very afraid um, situation approaching the court. And I think that, 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 you know, to the extent possible, everyone is trying to find ways um, to avoid the court, thinking strategically, thinking about what you appeal, thinking about putting cases together that 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 present the strongest arguments possible, praying that 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 story decisis um, has some meaning um, for for at least one or two members of the court. Um, but but also recognizing that there are things that you can do locally, that there are things under state law, that there are things that could be done without litigation. You know. Lawyers are the classic example of people who have that hammer of litigation, and so everything looks like a nail to them, or is it the other way around? Whatever. Um, and 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 I think that there have been initiatives. I mean, if you look at at criminal justice, there's actually been progress in a number of things dealing with um, with the. Um, with the reduction in some places, the reduction of mass incarceration. And that didn't happen so much as a result of federal lawsuits, but of, of working locally, of, of, of making arguments that make sense. I mean, the, the frustrating thing about everything we're talking about is that it is both unfair and cruel and inefficient. It doesn't make sense economically to educate or not educate people the way we are now, and yet we persist in doing it, and we pay the costs in, in higher incarceration rates, in, in unemployment, in crime, in a whole range of things, and that if we approached it, if we found a way to talk about this in a way that made it clear that, 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 that this is also economically a stupid thing to do, then, then maybe we could achieve some progress. I would just add two thoughts. One is, again, um, the, it's another reason why the 2020 election matters. Uh, the, the biggest, one of the bigger news stories that is not in the news is a way in which the Trump administration has deeply remade the federal courts already um, in, in just two and a half years. And so um, that becomes critical. The second thing I will say, just what you said, Dennis, is that 
many things that I'm talking about, and I think that Ms. Kim was talking about, have very little to do with the federal courts. Most of which I, what I'm talking about, New York City could resolve itself. Uh, again, this progressive liberal city could resolve itself. Um, there are administrative rules, there are rules within the DOE deciding how you, there's no federal legal barrier to doing most of the things that, that we're describing. Um, so all the work is not about what's happening in DC. The question is, um, why isn't there movement in this liberal, liberal governor, liberal state legislature, liberal mayor, liberal city council? Um, why is uh, really devastatingly racist educational practices not only maintaining, but in fact, in some cases, growing and thriving, despite uh, a largely democratic, largely left political actors at every stage of the game. We might have time for one more question. Yes, in the front. I'll just answer someone who works locally. I think it's one of the greatest challenges always is to work across systems. I think there's a, a lot of, um, yeah, the, the offices that work with housing need to work with the offices that are working with education, need to work with so, uh, child welfare groups, all these, you know, mental health, all these organizations, all these big bureaucracies need to work together. And um, there's symptoms all over the place of that not happening. Um, but that is one of the great challenges in New York City is the government is so big, the system is so big, and how do you get everything to work together? You know, Rich obviously has huge experience of that, but to me that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. I think we're at time, so I'm sorry, did you wanna, you can, please. Well, I, another 2020 election point. I, uh, I mean, the, the point you're making, um, Kim is making, you know, it goes all the way up to the top, of course. We have different congressional committees, different federal agencies, mm -hmm different state agencies and never the twain will speak to each other. Um, you know, during the Obama administration, they started to make real progress in this area. They started to connect HUD and the Department of Education on, you know, public housing redevelopment and school transformation together in, in the Choice Neighborhoods program. Um, and uh, in the last year of the Obama administration, the three secretaries of housing, education and transportation basically sent out a letter to all the state and local government saying you guys have to work together on these issues and they were the agencies were primed to work together into the Clinton administration as a, they were thinking at that time um, and of course all of that progress has completely stopped now and I think um, if we get a new administration with a lot of the same thinking we're going to start to see that connection again um, starting at the you know at, in Congress with the committees who are starting to talk to each other a little bit great let's thank our panelists